Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the University of Georgia uh, Charter Annual Charter Lecture. I'm, I'm Pam Witten. I serve as the provost of the university. And I'm just going to take one minute, one minute to set the stage, and then I'm going to get off the stage, because we have some very, very interesting panelists I hear today for this topic. Um, so just a quick bit of history, because you know we love our history at the University of Georgia. Uh, you all are at the Charter Lecture today, uh, which is so named after the charter that was originally created to launch the University of Georgia. And if you're new to one of these events, you perhaps don't appreciate that the University of Georgia was the first public university to be chartered in the United States, and this is way back in 1785. So many of us like uh, to like the claim to fame that we are the first public, official public university uh, in the university, I'm sorry, in the, in the United States at this point. And, and the charter, um, the notion of the charter was really important and revolutionary for, for various reasons. Certainly, it was an acknowledgement and a recognition that an educated citizenry is essential to good government, period. So if, if our citizens are well educated and thoughtful and exposed to important ideas, which is our goal today, then we're all better served for it. The second notion was, was government and its agencies have a responsibility to educate its citizens. And then finally, the doors of knowledge should be open to all people, not just the privileged few. And that, that's certainly all of us today. So the Charter Lecture uh, has actually been around for a while. Uh, since 1988, there have been more than 60 distinguished speakers here that have presented Charter Lectures. And I look around this room and I see in many, many students who actually weren't alive in 1988 uh, when we began that lecture. Uh, but, but we're happy to have you here today and, and look forward um, to many years out when we talk about the 120 speakers so far. So Spring 28 Charter Lecture this year celebrates uh, the tremendous success of our state in establishing a thriving entertainment industry in Georgia. In 2017 alone, if I have my facts right, Lee, 320 feature films and TV productions were actually made in Georgia. Is that correct? That is correct. Wow. And through activity that's been generated by this filming and production and film tourism and all the support services that surround this, um, a host of, including accountants and other professionals, the entertainment industry in Georgia has had a $9.5 billion economic impact on our state, and that was just in 2017 alone. So hurry up so we can talk about 10 billion plus next year, or this year. <laughs> our panelists today um, are, are, are truly just extraordinary, and I know that you're all gonna so enjoy them. And, and so um, they will be further introduced, I believe, by Jeff in just a moment. But just to acknowledge, um, we have Gail Ann Hurd, um, who among many, many other things, you probably know her best if you're from the state of Georgia, serving as the executive producer of just a little show called The Walking Dead uh, that's around. Uh, Will Parker. Um, Packer. Uh, such Packer. A Packer. Sorry. It's OK. It's my reading. It's not a typo. It's okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> He's Will to me. We had lunch together, so we go way back. So just call you Will. I'm sorry, Will. Uh, Will has certainly been such a leader uh, in, in the industry with um, very significant hits as a producer of Straight Outta Compton as well as Ride Along, which was filmed in Georgia as well. Yes. Thank you for that. Uh, Lee Thomas, uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Film, Music, and Digital Entertainment for the Georgia Department of Economic Development, is also here with us today. And Lee's office has contributed greatly, greatly to the rise of the film industry in the state of Georgia. As we've said, direct spending attributed to filming in Georgia has ridden, risen from 68 million in 2007 to 2.7 billion in 2017 alone. Quite an impact. And then finally, our moderator today, Jeb Stefakoff, it's an easy name to say, I got that one, <laughs> serves as an executive director of the Georgia Film Academy, which is a collaborative effort of the University System of Georgia and the Technical College System of Georgia to support the workforce needs of the entertainment industry throughout the state of Georgia. And this academy is, is very important, and hopefully Jeff will have the chance to speak to it more, in allowing students really from across the state to earn certification in film that includes courses and everything from on-set film production, lighting, set construction, and other skills. And so the establishment and growth of the entertainment industry in Georgia is truly one of our, our state's greatest success stories. So on that note, I'd like to turn the session over to Jeff. Let's get it started. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Provost Witten. Thank you, Nancy McDuff. Thank you, Dr. Moorhead. 
What an honor to be here today, and how exciting to be on the same stage with this incredible talent. Um, I've been asked to tell you all a little bit more about these folks. I could simply say, um, tell us about yourselves, but I have spent some time with these folks today, and I can tell you they are too modest to talk about themselves. And you need to know a little bit more about their incredible background. Gail Ann Hurd, one of the industry's most respected film and television producers, in 1984, produced and co-wrote her first feature film, Terminator. Has anyone heard of uh, this, this motion picture? <laughs> Quickly followed by uh, success with Aliens, uh, which received seven nominations and two Academy Awards, followed by the Academy Award winning film, The Abyss, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, and The Ghost in the Darkness, and uh, a lot of other credits as well. Gail is an executive producer on The Walking Dead, first series in history to reign as the most watched TV drama in the 18 to 49 year old demographic for five consecutive years. Six. For six consecutive Ooh. years. Ooh. All right. She's also the EP, executive producer of AMC's Fear the Walking Dead. She's a producer on uh, Talking Dead. She's on Falling Water. We've got to mention Lore as well. Uh, in 2015, Heard was presented with the prestigious David O. Selznick Award for Achievement in Motion Pictures by the Producers Guild of America. And a few years ago, she received her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Wow. Super producer Will Packer <laughs> is a Hollywood hit maker. Nine of his films have opened at number one at the box office, and collectively they have grossed over a billion dollars. Pretty amazing. Those movies include Ride Along, No Good Deed, Think Like a Man, Obsessed, Takers, and Stomp the Yard. He was the executive producer on the mega hit Straight Outta Compton, which has grossed over $200 million. And his film last year, Girls Trip. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> has crossed the $100 million threshold. A couple of years ago. 140, but whatever. 140 it million. <laughs> Let's, Jeff, keep going. I don't, right. whatever. It doesn't matter. A couple of years ago, he was nominated for an Emmy on uh, the series Roots. Uh, he was the executive producer of that. He has an overall deal with Universal Studios. He's been on the cover of tons of magazines, Essence, Black Enterprise long lists of um, most um, significant producers in Hollywood have Will's name featured on them. And uh, perhaps most importantly, he's a longtime Atlanta resident. That's so right. So very honored to have him with us here honored today. To be here. And Lee Thomas, a UGA graduate. Yay. Yes. Yay. Is our Deputy Commissioner at the Georgia Department of Economic Development and the Director of the Georgia Film, Music, and Digital Entertainment Office. Simply put, Lee is the quiet force behind what is this explosive and unprecedented industry we have here in Georgia. She did get her BA here at Georgia in Radio, TV, and Film. She got a master's degree from Georgia State. She entered the doctoral program at Tisch. Um, she's been working at the Atlanta Film Office since 1996. Did you hear the part about the quiet force behind this industry here? That's Lee Thomas. So again, I'm really, really honored to be here today with this incredible talent. Um, guys, let's start at the beginning, because um, we have uh, at least 20 minutes to get through this. Um, t tell us, uh, let, let's start with Will, and let's um, hear from, from the three of you. How, how'd you get started in the business? I know people want to hear this. And tell us about your connection to Georgia. Um, for me, I started uh, while I was at Florida a University. That's where I went to my undergrad, and I was majoring in electrical engineering. It wasn't um, something that I thought I wanted to do long term. It wasn't where my passion was. You know, students in the room, if you're if you're in a, a degree or a focus that um, or, that you're not like want to do for the rest of your life, it's okay. I'm here to tell you that right now because that's where I was. I was majoring in electrical engineering and I knew I didn't want to be an engineer. But along the way, I helped out a buddy who wanted to make a little film about college life as we knew it. And I helped him to get the financing and, and uh, cast it and ultimately uh, self-distribute it. And we made a little money. And Later, I found out that that's what a producer does. And my plan was to always leave FAMU and go to um, 
go to Wharton because I wanted to get my MBA because I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just didn't know what type of entrepreneur. But I made money without yeah. going to an Ivy League school. And I did it on my own. <laughs> and I found like an audience that cared about the content that we had created. And I said, well, I can do this on my own. And that really is what drove me. Uh, we moved to Atlanta because we graduated and we said, all right, well, we're going to try this film thing. And we looked at New York and LA, and that's where people usually go. And we said, boy, those are some big ponds, <laughs> and we would be small fish. And we said, we would like to go to Atlanta because we could be a big fish in a small pond. And we said, you know what? We got a plan. We'll go to Atlanta. The music industry was popping. We came in 96. That's when I graduated from college. The Olympics had just come here. And this was a time where you had, like, you know, um, Dallas Austin and Outkast and Jermaine Dupri and all the music folks, especially in hip hop, were really popping in Atlanta at that time. And we said, if nothing else, we can keep the lights on by producing music videos until we get the film thing going. Well, we moved to Atlanta, and the music industry was so sewn up, and everybody knew each other, and we were these outsiders, and we couldn't get one music video. We could get <laughs> nobody to hire us. True story. <laughs> and you know what it forced us to do? To go out and do an independent movie on our own, right. because we had to. If it had gone another way, I wouldn't be sitting on this stage. But I was forced to go out and make a small, tiny, independent movie, and that's kind of what led me in the, the trajectory I'm on. Awesome. Yeah. And, and real quickly, your connection to Georgia? Well, that was what I was just yeah. saying, yeah. Jeff, was that's why I, I went <laughs> in. And then, I don't know. But you're, I give you another connection. You're, you're, um, you're here. The Bulldogs are great. Right, Have you man. seen that football team? <laughs> They're Boy, good. I, I was you're, rooting for them. You're, here, the, you're here most of the time? I, I am. No, so I, I'm based here now. Yeah. Um, and this is home, Atlanta's home. Um, but I do have offices in LA and now New York. So I go back and forth, travel all the time on the road. But for me, I like being in uh, Atlanta because unlike a lot of my peers in the industry, I'm outside of the Hollywood bubble. Right. And a lot of folks um, in the industry are always talking to other folks in the industry. And that's just the nature of it. And I like to think that I've spent a lot of time interacting with real people, yeah. with my consumers, with people who are actually going to go and, and watch and purchase my content. And I think it gives me a heads up to not be in that bubble all the time. Awesome. Yeah. Gail, again, I, I know everybody is dying to hear how, how you got started. And, you, and again, your connection to our state. Um, well, I'm very old. So I started uh, <laughs> back in the 70s. I went to Stanford University, which is not really known for its film program. Um, but uh, while I was there, I was initially an economics major, and I happened to go to their foreign study program, which was in the UK, because I am monolingual. And so my foreign study program had to be in an English-speaking country, uh, which, made, which meant I went to England, uh, which just happened during that fall, winter, had an intensive program in economics and also one in film and broadcasting. Uh, and I thought, oh my god, you can take classes in this? This is fantastic. Yeah. You know, I love film, and I love television, and uh, I decided to add that major. So I ended up with two degrees, uh, economics and communications. But in order to complete that degree in the two years that I had left, I mean, it was my junior year and my senior year, I ended up taking three courses from the same professor, a professor by the name of Stephen Kovacs. So anyone who, who thinks that college cannot be where your career starts, as you can see, they're wrong. Right. The people that we both met in college, you know, shaped where shaped our future. Yep. So, um, so this professor was hired by Roger Corman. How many of you have heard of Roger Corman? So Roger Corman's King of the Bees, known as King of the Bees. He was a director, but he also started the careers of Martin Scorsese and Jonathan Demme and Francis Ford Coppola, uh, Ron Howard, um, Jim Cameron, the, me, the list goes on. But um, uh, so I got a call right after I graduated saying, come down for an interview for Roger. Um, and also the only time where having a really good GPA mattered. Uh, although I see your magna cum laude in electrical <laughs> engineering, which is a much bigger deal than, <laughs> than my degree. Um, and uh, Roger, who I didn't realize because there was no Wikipedia or internet back then, so I couldn't research him. Uh, I didn't realize that he made these Z-grade exploitation films. Uh, and I came down there with my you know, Phi Beta Kappa from Stanford and thought that I was interviewing for uh, executive assistant for life job. 
only to be surprised that his first question was, what career path do you want to pursue? And as it turns out, in, 19, in the 70s, Roger Corman was the only person that I could have gone to work for who basically believed that I said I wanted to be a producer, really didn't know what that meant, but it sounded good. And, uh, and within three years, I was producing. And it was all down to having the right mentor, learning the right skill set, and, uh, you know, and working really damn hard. Um, and, and Terminator, quickly, uh, I met Jim Cameron. He was building spaceship props in the model department on a film called um, Battle Beyond the Stars. And I was the assistant production manager, so he actually worked for me. Um, and um, we were working 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and we started talking story. And we decided that we would work together on the, ne the first, the second film. We all we said we'd go out and get an experience, and we worked together on the second film. I did a movie called Smokey Bites the Dust, which is not Smokey and the Bandit. Um, <laughs> it was Roger Corman's Z-grade $280,000 uh, ripoff of Smokey Bites, uh, Smokey and the Bandit. And Jim did Piranha 2: The Spawning. How many knew that Jim Cameron's first film was Piranha 2, The Spawning? Wow. Very good. He's <laughs> taken it off his list of credits. Uh, the, <laughs> the tagline for, uh, for it, uh, it was about uh, uh, saltwater piranha that fly. <laughs> Your typical Roger Corman movie. Yes. Um, and, uh, and our second movie, uh, the, the movie that we did together was The Terminator. And Nine, we, I mean, literally knocked on 99 doors who said, no, we don't want to produce this. This is crap. What do you think you're doing? And the 100th one said yes. So don't give up. Love it. Right. So true. So true. <laughs> Lee, why don't, why don't you tell us about how you got started? Well, I, I didn't have the high, highest GPA like these two guys. <laughs> Not even close. But I did see REM at the 40 watt several times. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think we're all even. So uh, yeah, so I, you know, UGA, then Georgia State, then NYU, and I knew I wanted to come back to Georgia. Um, it was too cold in New York for me, and I wanted to come back. But back at the time, and it was 96, Will, Will and I both came back to, to Georgia at the same time. Um, but it was too hard to work in film then. It was really, you know, it was hit or miss. You would work, and then you wouldn't work for half a year, and then you'd work. And we just didn't have a lot going on. Um, it was kind of right about when Canada started putting in place tax incentives, we started really losing our business. So I came back and I decided to work for the Film Commission. I thought it would go, you know, I'd do a couple of years there and see if things got better, but I ended up staying for quite a long time. So, you know, our office was actually started by Jimmy Carter in 1973 because of a little movie called Deliverance, which shot in Rabin County, which is where I have a home too. Um, and so in the first 35 years of our film office, we did $5 billion worth of economic impact. And last year we did $9.5 billion worth of economic impact. So we almost doubled it in, in one year, uh, the first 35 years. So it's, it's been really exciting to see the changes. Um, you know, uh, I think Gail was a person that we would send the um, Manila folders of 35 millimeter photos <laughs> to out in, in LA, and we always dreamed of having one of her movies. And Will was one that he came up like through the ranks of uh, Georgia doing a little bit bigger film every time. And we, we've been so proud to see his ex success. And I always get people say, you know, I, I want to be Will Packer. And it's like, it's a lot of work to be Will Packer. It's a lot of work <laughs> to be Gail and her, too. So uh, we're, we're very excited about the opportunities that are going on right now. Yeah. So y'all you know what? Can I say yeah, something? Yeah. Gail, Gail said something that I, I want to um, just kind of underscore, which was how many people told you no. And it only took that one yes. And, and I know so many people in this room can understand and relate to that because you're in the middle of the nose, right? And sometimes when you're in the middle of the nose, you're looking at people on stage that have gotten a bunch of yeses, those no's just seem so disheartening and they don't seem sexy. But pay attention though, pay attention because the route is never straightforward and there's so many challenges. My version of that, and we all have a version of that, is my first big movie that uh, was a theatrical release, was a wide theatrical release, was a movie called Stomp the Yard. And Stomp the Yard was literally a movie that I took to every studio in Hollywood. Every studio. And every studio told me no. 
So I, I didn't get the 99, I got 100 no's. Like I got no yeses. Everybody <laughs> said no. And what happened was I then went and reconfigured the way that I pitched the movie. Because I was pitching it as this movie about like um, college life and fraternities and sororities and nobody was buying that. And then I went and I pitched it as a step dance movie and I went to, I went back to the same studios and most of them said, didn't you just leave here last week? <laughs> Didn't we just tell you no? Like, do you not think we know? You got a hat on. We know it's the same. You didn't have a hat on. You put, it's the same dude. We're still saying no. But one place, which was Sony, was looking for a dance movie. And that was the place, ultimately, that gave us the yes. And it wasn't even a yes to my movie. I had pitched it as a potential sequel to a movie they had done called You Got Served. It was this R&B group, B2K, anybody remember You Got Served? So You Got Served was one of their most successful movies that year um, on a per income basis. And I said, well, you know what? This could be like a You Got Served 2 companion piece. They were like, now that's an idea. Yes. I said, let's go. And that ultimately ended up being Stomp the Yard. So my point is just that I think sometimes that gets missed when you have like people with like, impressive resumes that have done a bunch of stuff. There's a lot of failure, a lot of failure it that it takes. It sounds like perseverance. No question. Yeah. Dan, yes. anything you want to say about perseverance and uh, how much it's required in the entertainment industry? Well, you know, it's maybe this is the sa same as true for you, but if I want to make something in the horror genre, it's a lot easier than if I want to make anything else. And I've got a documentary that's going to be airing on PBS next month about the first woman to... Uh, be elected principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. Her name was Wilma Mankiller. And um, so we got $100,000 from Vision Maker Media, which is an arm of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Write your legislator and make sure that the funding yeah. for PBS and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting does not go away because it's on the chopping block right now. Um, and so we went to Kickstarter. We did a Kickstarter campaign, and Mankiller was made because of Walking Dead fans, who real we because we realized just like you were saying, it's a story about an extraordinary woman in extraordinary times, an ordinary woman in extraordinary times, who was in the right place at the right time with the right skill set to succeed, uh, who did not you know you would never predict it that she, this woman who at some point was living in her car on Cherokee tribal lands would seven years later be the leader of her nation. Um, and, uh, and it connected with, with the Walking Dead fans and they funded the film. Wow. So once again, just even, a, you know, you may say, oh, well, you guys can do anything. The truth is, you, we can't. We, you know, we can't just say, you know, this is what we want to do and people line up to pay for it. Um, and it helps us be better filmmakers to realize who our audience is and how to connect with them. Yes. So, and you, you, you never outgrow that. All right. Very true. Well, I have some more questions about um, how people get started. Um, but first, y'all have noticed um, that we have an entertainment industry here. 320 films last year, almost $10 billion. I, I think people would be interested uh, in your, your take on what we're doing right here in Georgia. Um, what, do you, what do you like? We've heard a little about what you like working here. I'd like to hear more about it, Will. What, oh, how, do you, how do you think? It's, why do you think we're killing it? Well, I mean. I, <laughs> we are killing it. We are killing it, Jeff. <laughs> Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Um, a big part of that, I'd say it whether she was here or not, though, is, is Lee. You have to have an infrastructure, right? Yes. So, absolutely. Thank you. What 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 she and her team has has done is nothing short of incredible because this. Georgia could be a lot of different places, and play, people have tried. New Orleans and Louisiana, you know, North Carolina, um, North Carolina Michigan. Like, there are other places that have put tax incentives in place that have tried to lure uh, Hollywood folks to come and shoot there and turn them into these big, huge hubs of production. And uh, it doesn't always work. You have to have an infrastructure there. At the end of the day, the, um, the film business isn't run by creatives, and you may have heard this before, right? It's not the directors and the writers, producers get the credit, but it's really the accountants, right. okay? It's the bean counters. It's the people that are determining how much you can spend on your movie, 
how much they anticipate that movie or television show making back. The accountants are the ones who, at the end of the day, fund our projects. And people sitting way away from Georgia decide whether or not it makes sense to shoot a project in Georgia. And you can't just have a tax credit. You have to have a system that makes sense uh, so you can shoot efficiently and save money. And um, at the end of the day, you know, our business operates under a, a, an economic imperative, and, and we all you know, are subject to that. And Georgia has done a very good job of being welcoming to the industry. Um, it is the people are great, really, because you know you shoot in LA, and it, I shouldn't just say LA, but you shoot other places, and it's not the same. It, the people don't want you there. You know, they are, they're horror stories of you trying to shoot on location and people like bringing out bullhorns or drums or stuff to like make noise and then saying, well, if you pay me, I'll stop making noise. Because technically, if you're shooting in the public, you know, in a public area, they can do what they want. I can't stop you from blowing an air horn on your property, but I can say, would you please stop? And other places they won't until you pay them. A lot of places in Atlanta will say, you know what, this is kind of cool. So Atlanta's not jaded yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think it will be. I think it's a great place. And the other thing is that you have so many looks, right? So you can right. come to Atlanta, you can shoot metropolitan, you can shoot rural, uh, you've got an amazing diversity of people. So you can shoot a lot of different incredible backdrops. I will give an extremely huge shout out to Black Panther, number yes. one movie in the galaxy right now. So huge. And Wakanda was Atlanta. Yeah. That's where, that's where Wakanda was. It was shot right here, right there in Atlanta. So, very awesome. cool. Yeah. Gail, what do, you, what do you think we're doing right here? Well, um, this is another thing where, um, you know, whoever is elected in the future, future uh, in terms of governor and the legislature is going to be very important to determine whether or not the tax credits continue. Because what, Atlanta, what Georgia has done right is take the tax credits and build out the industry. Um, you know, last year I shot a streaming series for Amazon. Lore here, we shot, we shot uh, the Atlanta area for Germany, Ireland, uh, Florida, uh, Massachusetts, and a number of other places um, because of the amazing work that Lee does. But we came here because of the tax incentives. We came here because of the fantastic crews that are here, the fantastic actors. I mean, I will put the actors that are here up against, I mean, the, the number of people that we are able to hire locally on The Walking Dead that we're now hiring on my new feature film, Hellfest, here, I, it, it's just fantastic. And all of you can benefit from that if, if you're interested in pursuing this as a career. So uh, the number of studios, the, the, the fact that this is um, not only just sort of a transitory business, the way it has been for many states that the tax incentives didn't work for, like let's say Michigan or you know small states without any kind of infrastructure, um, but without the tax incentives, you you can't just say well people will come here anyway. I can tell you I'm a fourth generation Californian. The industry in California continues to lose out to Georgia, and it will continue to do so because people. <coughs> As Will said, it is, it is people counting the money, determining where they can make the most profit, where they can make their film or TV project look great um, with terrific production values, but for the cheapest possible number. And mm -hmm. without tax incentives, that's all gone. And, and it's so important because we can lose it, okay? It can change just like that. That's why it's so, and I know this is, uh, you know, a group that is progressive and engaged and understands the importance of being a part of the political process. What you just said is so true. California thought they could never, ever, ever lose their position, especially when it came to, like, on-location shooting. They thought... We don't care what anybody else does. We don't need to guard our position. We don't need to offer any incentives because we're Hollywood. There's no way that people are going to fly across the country to Georgia to shoot. And guess what? They are flying right across the country <laughs> to Georgia to shoot. And that's what happens. And so, but it can, it can change very quickly. And that's why I always encourage people to, to pay attention to 
um, the people that are supporting interests that align with yours and make sure that you are a part of the political process because that is really where this kind of, you talk about all the economic impact, it happened because there was a group that lobbied for years, you know, and Lee was at the head of it. I had a small part in it, but that group is what was able to push that tax incentive through finally. And now that we have it, hopefully we can keep it because we can all benefit. It's created an ecosystem here, which is rivaled, you know, by no one, really. And, and by the way, and, and what Jeff and what the Film Academy does is amazing. Yes. Because we have students on our set of The Walking Dead who are who are interning and learning a skill set yeah. that they will be paid to continue to perform. And these are great jobs. These are jobs with benefits. These are jobs that are middle class and upper middle class jobs. Um, and, uh, and because of the amount of production here, if you want to work and you're good at it, you can work 12 months a year. Mm -hmm. That is not true in most places and in most, because this is, it's still a gig economy essentially, you know, and in film and TV when you, you know, you, sometimes you work, sometimes you don't. In Georgia now you can work 12 months a year. Yes. And thank you again for your support of the Film Academy. We really appreciate it. Lee, anything, anything you want to add to uh, the uh, conversation about uh, what we're doing right here? No, I mean, you know, we had a lot going for us, the, the climate and the airport and the locations and everything, but it's the, it's the tax credit, uh, that, and, you know, just, just making sure that we stay a favorable place for the film industry yeah. and that we don't pass things that are going to make it so uh, the film industry doesn't want to shoot in Georgia, which they have done in neighboring states, and we've seen their crew move in and we've seen their shows move in, and hopefully that will be a warning shot to uh, some of the legislators out there right. who who may put those kind of things in place. Guys, uh, Will, Gail, uh, let, let's talk about your professional work a little bit. Um, Lee's nodding. Um, um, let's start with development. Uh, how do you, what, what's the process like when, when material comes to you, when you're thinking about developing something? And, and what I'd be really interested to know is, um, how do you know when something's great? How do you know when you want to invest in it? And, and moreover, what defines great? Commercial great versus other kinds of great? What, what do you think, Will? You want to start? Um, what's, your, sure. what's your development process like? Uh, well, it's my my development process is not unlike a lot of um, production companies and producers in that we're I'm always looking for ideas from every quarter. I'm always looking for um, you know IP, real life stories, amazing ideas, and then I have to figure out if an amazing idea doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be an amazing piece of content. So that's the first right. thing, and that's a lot of that's what a lot of up and coming film. Um, makers make a mistake about because they think, oh, that's a great story. And it may be, but it doesn't mean it would be a great movie or a great television show. Um, maybe it may make a great documentary, but it doesn't mean it will always translate to like a, a, a scripted format. But for me, I'm always trying to hit the sweet spot of uh, commercial success and um, not as much critical success, but like uh, an organic uh, reson resonance. Like yes. I want something that really resonates with an audience, right? So I want something that not only a lot of people want to see that can, that can be commercially successful, but also will make people feel something. Okay. And so I'm always kind of chasing that, and, and sometimes it's hard to serve those two masters. But, you know, it's... How much do you think it's gut? Oh, a lot. I yeah. mean, I Taste. mean, I've... It, yes, a lot of it. Because I, I, um, I have a lot of... Um, of confidence in my instincts over the years, and they've you know led me pretty well. And I think yeah. that you know you have to kind of you have to grow it and hone it and learn it. Um, but you don't you know you don't make it to this level without having good instincts. Um, and especially now because audiences are so fragmented, right. um, and there's such a saturation of content. Whatever you're into, you can find it. Um, and you can watch it pretty much when you want to, where you want to. So for producers, it means that we have to be uh, very deliberate and specific about what we're making and who we're making it for. Uh, because with very you know, few exceptions, um, most content is speaking to a specific audience. Now, there's four quadrant stuff out there. There's you know, anything Marvel does, Star Wars. Right. Like, there are huge movies that just appeal to everybody. But, these days, content is very much about finding an audience that will own that content and will say, this is for me, this is mine, I'm going to, you know, t talk about it and, and really be connected with it. That's what I'm trying to do. Yes, yes. 
Gail, what's your process like? And how do you decide when to, when to dig in on something? Uh, well, I have a, a development staff, yes. and they sift through all the submissions. Um, but a lot of times, it, there's IP that I respond to and I reach out and try to acquire, which was the case with The Walking Dead. Um, and um, you know, a, a lot of the projects that, that I've developed were material IP, the intellectual property uh, that I acquired and then packaged with, um, with a writer, with a director, and then went out to a studio or to a network. Um, but it really, it really has to be, we, we know, um, it's gotta be something I'm, I have to be willing to give up part of my time and energy and life for, because this is not a nine to five job. This is not something, it's, you literally, I'm in production 50 weeks a year, and the two weeks over Christmas, I am still reading material, I'm watching cuts, I'm giving notes, and if you want to make some money and not give that kind of commitment, this is not the career for you. It does not stop. And, um, you know, so it, it's really got, it's got to hit me where it, when the going gets tough, and we'll tell you, the going gets tough on everything. Everything that you may think, oh, that must have been easy, it was such a hit, had so many roadblocks and obstacles along the way. And junctions where we could have taken the easy path and made it a total disaster, or held firm and, you know, and continued with our vision. And it, I think part of producing is the art of the right compromise, because you're gonna compromise along the way, and at some point there's a compromise that you just have to say no. Um, so, so, so to me, that it, it really is, it's, it's always a negotiation. Mm -hmm. Every day there's a negotiation, whether it's with a studio, a network, an actor, director or writer, um, and trying to keep the family happy and together and going in the same yeah. direction the entire time. You know, I, I know a lot of people in this audience are interested in working in the film and television industry. Um, can you share with them a little bit more detail about what your, what your lives are like, and in particular, when we're in production, when you're in production? <laughs> but, well, do, let do, you, do you want them to continue to want to be in film and television? I want them or to you, want to want it. So oh, then, let, tell, then you don't them, want to hear the truth. Let, you let don't them, want us to tell them how our lives are. You guys want to know what it's like when you actually work in production from these two? No, I mean, yeah. it's, it's Gail hinting at it. It is... <laughs> It's a massive, massive amount of work, yeah. massive. And there are more opportunities than ever. There are more uh, platforms and distribution outlets than ever, but there is more content being created than ever. There are more people that are trying to get into those slots than ever before. And there's more competition than ever before. So um, the thing about producing is that no project is ever the same, like whatever, worked on Terminator and on Ride Along will absolutely not work on whatever my next one is and her next one. It's just, I guarantee you, every project, and that is part of the, the, the fun of the challenge, is that every time you're trying to you know, push the ball up the hill and get a project over the finish line, is a new set of challenges. It will take a new approach. I, I have an engineering degree, which I actually, people sometimes will ask, well, you know, well, you wasted that time in college. I'll say, no, not really, because it forced me to, um, to hone my analytical skills, to think with an analytical mind. And at the end of the day, producing is really about problem solving. It requires you to be very, very creative, um, but the analytical side of your brain is always working because there's so many challenges. So, you know, on, on a daily basis, there is um, uh, more, more problems and issues and challenges than you have hours to deal with. Right. But I don't want to make it seem like it's all bad because, I, I mean, we love what we do, right? Um, you know, it's, it's, I want to encourage you, but I want to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. Like, it needs to, there's a, an element of passion, that untangible, not about the money, not about the fame and the lights. Like, it's so easy to see that element of it, but you've got to have a passion to, my opinion, to create, you gotta have a passion for the content, for whatever reason that is. For me, I wanted to create content that people weren't creating. I wanted to put, 
people on screen that nobody else was putting on the screen. I wanted to put four black women specifically behaving badly at the Essence Festival in a comedy, put that on screen, right? I want, nobody else was doing that. Right. I wanted to do that. And it happened to make a lot of money, it happened to be fulfilling, and it happened to you know, create a, a, a brand new star with Tiffany Haddish, all that was great. But at its onset, I was like, this is a story that I want to tell. And so I went through the process, you know, for that one, it was like two and a half, three year process right. to get it made. So, you know, for me, that's what it is. I think you have to have that. And that's the only thing that sometimes I caution people because it feels like, oh, well, there's so much opportunity out there, but it's, it's, it's a really tough uh, and a lot of high barriers for entry. But once you're in and you're passionate about it, that can sustain you, yes. I believe that. Gail, you wanna say anything about this? Uh, well, to give you an idea, um, you know, you're always, if you're shooting days, you're up before the sun comes up, a long time before the sun comes up. You've already solved like three problems. There are 130 emails in your inbox with people asking you questions that you need to respond to. And you have to respond quickly, but you also have to be right. Um, and you know, when you get to set, there will be an issue, you know, uh, an actor is late and you have to figure out what the best way is of getting them to set and making sure it never happens again. And uh, you know, it's raining and the, the sequence that day calls for sun, what do you do? Do you just shoot it as is and then change the script all the way along because it wasn't supposed to be raining. I mean, literally everything is, is a decision tree and as you were saying, I mean, your analytical mind has to take over because you have to think about all of the consequences and all the unintended consequences of every decision that you make. Um, but the joy of it is that it's a team sport and if you like working with a team, there is no better industry than the film and television industry because you survive or fail based on the team that you have around you um, and, and how you work together to achieve results with never enough time and never enough money. I mean, just to give you an idea, you know, The Walking Dead is a, essentially a 45 minute show. We shoot it in eight days. And you know, movies, you don't see a 90 minute movie that's been shot in the most cases in 18 days. Uh, or 16 days, 16 days would be, you know, the equivalent of two Walking Dead episodes. Um, so you don't have a lot of opportunity to, to get it wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's, it is inexorable. The television machine is inexorable because eight days, after eight days, you're shooting another episode. And after eight days after that, you're shooting another episode. And, and it is, it's incredibly hard work and, uh, you know, you were saying that, that you know, when you were working on Dawson's Creek, it was 24 episodes a year, and you never had time off. I mean, 16 episodes of The Walking Dead just about kills us. So, um, you know, at the same time, doing a television show where you get 16 hours to get it, delve into character and, yeah. and um, you know, is, is an absolute joy to live with those characters. Um, if they survive, yes. um, <laughs> uh, is, is an absolute joy, 16 hours of that. Well, we're going to have some questions for the audience in just a moment, and I hope that some of those questions are um, about how um, students can break into the industry. Um, if I've got one more question. Work with you. Um, what's that? I said they Go need to work with you. <laughs> that, well, that's right. We can certainly help put them to work. <laughs> let, let me just ask you guys. It's been quite a year for the inter entertainment industry. and. Um, well, what do y'all think, uh, briefly, um, about the Me Too movement and diversity in the entertainment industry, which is something we're hearing a lot about this year? This year. Will, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's about time. Yes. Um, about damn time. I know about we're in a chapel, time. but I'm going to just be honest. Um, there have been uh, power structures set up in this industry for uh, since the industry was formed, decades and decades and decades, that... Um, were systematically designed to keep um, certain people out of it and certain people uh, out of power and to keep them disenfranchised. And that was primarily women and people of color. And that is changing. And it's changing, um, I see it in two tracks. I see, I see one track being the, um, the cultural movement 
with with within the industry of the industry trying to purge itself of you know people like the Weinstein's of the world who took advantage of their positions of power and the other uh, thing that's happening is that audiences are being far more responsive to um, to content that is diverse to content that is uh, more reflective of the world mm -hmm. you know you know you look at Black Panther that's a complete and total game, game changer, changer. Yeah. game changer it is it is you know unapologetically a movie that is about black superheroes and that would not have happened in the way that it's happening now 10 years ago five years five. ago but the fact that it's happened now, happening now, you will see things that will come after that, mm -hmm. um, that without a doubt, you will know Black Panther had a measurable impact on. So just, I think it's, I think it's great. I think it's great the change that is happening within this industry. Um, and you know, those, those are kind of two separate things, yeah. but really it's about a power structure that was, uh, you know, patriarchal. I even love the fact that this panel is two women and a person of color, right? Like, you the only white dude, brother. <laughs> Just, we're gonna, we're gonna let you stay up I here, but. It. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I think it's a good time. I really do. Yes. <laughs> Gail, anything you wanna say? I know um, there is. I, I think that the other thing to remember is, um, is that it's not just, uh, people in positions of power who are speaking out, you know, major name actresses. But what really inspired me was the Time's Up movement, which is, which has a fund now, a legal fund, uh, to defend women who don't have the financial wherewithal to call out um, people who have abused them. And I think. You can't have one without the other. And, and I am so impressed that so many people in Hollywood, male and female, put that together. Um, because it, it, the, the last thing that can happen is, I mean, if you're a crew person or you are going in on a, you know, you know, as an extra, you name it, someone who doesn't have the financial wherewithal to take on people with power and financial resources, now you can. And I, I, I think that that's important to remember is that it's the people that have never had a voice, um, the people working in the lower paying jobs, now they can also make sure that they work in an environment that is supportive and inclusive, fair, and that they're not taken advantage of. All right. Well, I, I know uh, time's about up, and um, I want to uh, introduce, uh, Lee, do you want to speak to this real quick? No. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Davis um, from the uh, uh, Grady uh, School of Journalism, Dean Davis, um, I believe, is going to uh, introduce some questions from the audience. Greetings, everybody. Uh, thanks to those of you who have been submitting questions on uh, hashtag Hollywood South. Uh, I noticed like two or three weeks ago that was the Louisiana film market that was <laughs> occupying Hollywood South. So we basically completely shoved them out of the way. So I think it's awesome. kind of metaphorical on some level. Um, <laughs> Wanted to, to give a quick shout out to a couple of Grady students who are behind said curtain moderating that Twitter conversation, uh, Jessica Twine and Catherine Kostaveski, uh, two wonderful students of mine. So thank you to you both. You. We're gonna see if we can't power through a few questions here uh, before you make your way over to the reception at Terrell Hall, and then I will take a couple more as you go. Um, I thought this one was kind of interesting, and, and Jeff and I have spent a fair bit of time talking about this very issue, as of, uh, we actually all have. Are most filming jobs in Atlanta centered around production, or does development and post-production frequently happen in Atlanta as well? What would help with post-production, question mark? Let's give that to Liz. Put that way up on the tee. <laughs> well, it uh, not very much development happens in Atlanta, a little bit, but the, the head of the beast is definitely still in Los Angeles. There's no question about that. Um, we, you know, there was a post-production incentive that came online in January of this year to help smaller post companies. Um, you know, post-production, if you do films in Georgia, that counts for our tax incentive. It hasn't moved the needle as much as we'd like to, uh, it to have seen. Um, but, you know, it's a start. We're, we're hoping that we can, you know, we talked about this a little bit at lunch, get writer's room here, writer's rooms here, get post-production here, and have a more indigenous industry here. Do you want to talk about that, Gail? Yeah. Anybody else uh, want to knock that around? 
Sure. Um, you know, it, it, it was a surprise to me, actually, finding out that, that if a writer's room here, that that can be covered within the tax credits. And the great news is getting the word out, that's the first step. Getting the word out, we'll take it back to Hollywood and say, you know what? Um, we, Jeff and I were talking about this at lunch. If you've got a show that's on the bubble, a TV series, where you've got to bring the budget down and you simply can't find another way to do it, this is one way to do it, and it could make the difference between another season or not, and that'll be a big incentive. Do you think that would help post-production if you had writer's rooms here? Uh, well, yes, because, because you know, you we our, our writer's right. rooms and post-production um, are always on The Walking Dead and Fear the Walking Dead in the same office. Mm -hmm. So that the showrunners literally walk down the hall to look at a cut in progress. Um, so I, I think that could have a huge impact. And it would be so good for, you know, for the, the people of Georgia, the students here, the students at other universities in Georgia, to have a different career path that they want to pursue. Here's another really interesting question. What does the future of diversity and representation in Hollywood look like? What challenges are still present? I think it looks bright. I will say that. I love that um, diversity and inclusion have um, become more important. I think that initially it was kind of like a cool thing to say in Hollywood, um, but then more diverse projects started making real money. And that's what Hollywood really pays attention to at the end of the day, honestly. <laughs> um, and so once you started to have real success with projects that um, were more inclusive uh, and diverse, then that's when you saw uh, studios and people that fund projects saying, we want to be a part of, we need to be a part of that. You almost have to be now. Um, you have to feel like, you know, content that is is really reflective of the world in which in which we live. I think, uh, and so I'm, I'm I'm happy about that. I think it will continue. I think it will give rise to more diverse voices who are interested in telling stories. Um, they have a bigger audience now than ever before because of the way that audiences have responded to diverse content. That's amazing. You know, in, in, in Hollywood, there, there has been, up until recently, a, an old boys club. Um, and it was very hard to break into that. Um, and you will still see, I mean, it's never been the case on my shows, but you will still see writers' rooms that are entirely white male. Um, and literally, if you'll talk to those showrunners, they'll say, well, I don't know any women who can write the way I, I, you know, the voice that I need to be written. I don't know any diverse voices who can give me exactly what I want. Um, it, it's because their, their circle is, is so small, um, and that's no longer an option. And in this case, the interesting thing is that the networks and the studios are saying, uh-uh, right. not anymore. Right. You, you have to get out of your comfort zone. And it's very rare, but we are living in a time now where it is the mandate of the studios and the networks who are saying that is not OK. So that's a sea change already. Here's another question coming in from hashtag Hollywood South. What would you say is the biggest difference between working for the film industry in Georgia compared to working in the film industry in Los Angeles? Well, I get to sleep in my own bed in Los Angeles um, <laughs> at home. Um, uh, you know, when you were talking about the people with like the air horns and stuff, mm -hmm. I, we, were shooting, we were shooting a show in Piru, which is uh, whenever you see sort of small town that's supposed to be any place but Los Angeles, in a film that's shot in the Los Angeles area, they've all been shot in Piru because it's still within the 30 mile studio zone. And there was a body shop there um, that was not open, except when there was production. And then they started banging, you know, and, you know, and welding and doing all these noisy things. And it was the, the same exact thing. It's like, oh, well, you know, we really have to get this car finished by the end of the day or our customer will be really unhappy. And we'll talk to the person across the street saying, there aren't any customers, that's their own car. And, you know, if you, if you give us a check for $5,000, we'll be quiet. So we just said, we're shooting MOS, which means goes back to you know, mit out sound, 
and uh, it's fine, just you know, make as much noise as you want. It wasn't true, we were shooting with sound, but the guy believed us and he packed up and went home, and that won't, would not happen here. Right. And, um, and also the crews are enthusiastic about coming to work. They're passionate about being in film, as opposed to a lot of people where you know it's just, well, this is what I've always done. I'm kind of over it, and you know, you know, when do we wrap? I want to get out of here, and I've I've never felt that while filming in Georgia. And I've filmed here for over uh, 12, 12 years. Yeah, there's definitely a sense of um, of being grateful that the industry is here amongst the uh, the crews, production personnel, uh, and that affects your set, it affects your end product. Um, I love shooting in, in Atlanta and in Georgia more than anywhere else. And I'm at the point now where about, about half of my stuff is shot here. Um, and so that's great. I get to be at home, you know, when I'm shooting here. But I, I just think it's a, it's, it's a great um, community that has embraced the film industry. Um, and I hope that continues, I really do. Well, there are upwards of 50 questions on Hollywood South now, um, so I'll commend the audience to go check them out. We're not going to be able to answer them all here, uh, but I wanted to leave the panel with one last one, and that is, what do you think is the next step in the evolution of the Georgia film industry? And I'll start with you, Jeff, and then we'll go that way. Well, um, we've spoken about this a bit. Um, I believe that we are on the verge of having a permanent sustainable entertainment industry here by having the full ecosystem of the business. These bubble shows that we've spoken about, um, I don't think Sean does come into Atlanta, but um, I, I do think that there's a tier of uh, writers and writer producers who, um, when given the opportunity to have their show picked up, may opt to come to Georgia and write those shows here. And when they're writing here, students who are looking for internships in writer's rooms, or as a showrunner's assistant, or as an executive producer's assistant, can go work with those folks here in Georgia and then become writers. And I think when that happens, the agencies come here and open up shops and the financing comes and post-production will be here. And I think we will have, as I say, the full ecosystem of a business which can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Los Angeles, New York, Bollywood, London. Yep, agreed. I mean, the, the, the cycle for Fillmore Television typically is development production, post-production, and then release, right? And we've got one of those. We've got production. Mm -hmm. We've got a really good handle on physical production. But if you're a writer, you are a director, you are an actor to some degree, a lot of times you got to go to L.A. Acting not as much because we do find a lot of actors locally, but if you want to be involved in the creative process or you want to get your project sold, you still got to go somewhere else. You can't really stay in Georgia. So when we do have a full ecosystem and myself and others are trying to work to create this and it takes, you know, it's not just one entity. It's not just one show. You need multiple so that you can create a feeder system so that folks that are looking to get in can say, I can do I can go and get in the writer's room or I can go pitch my project right here in Atlanta, that's really where our strength is going to be and put us on par with, you know, any place in the world. I really can't, I have to say, I can't really, <laughs> I can't really add to that. I, I think you both put it beautifully. Um, but something that you said earlier really struck me, which is that choosing to live here to be out of the Hollywood bubble. I think that's really important. I think there are so many voices that aren't in Hollywood, and when they get to Hollywood, after a certain point, they start having the same experiences and the same friends same friend. and the same, you know, the same interactions. That it is absolutely important um, that there be writers' rooms here. That um, that there there that what is special about Georgia begins to inform the content at that early stage. I would leave it right there. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Let me thank all the panelists and you for coming out. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good job. Yeah.